you know, there's consequences of not spraying the crops with herbicides or pesticides because, you know, the, the worms, the insects go in and they basically decrease your crop yield. You know, I was digging potatoes the other day and the gophers basically ate my entire potato crop, you know, without me even knowing because they're underground. So the beauty is that you cannot replicate that taste of that naturally grown corn, but the offside is that you, you get competing insects <laughs> that that take your crop. But you know, I will always, you know, err on the side of providing a nutrient rich, really great tasting product, even if it means that the insects and the varmints, you know, take half my, my crop. You just have to plant more. Well, big agriculture is obviously a for-profit business. In running any business, you have to have projections. You've got to have some predictability of what that end product is gonna be. So by using these chemicals and genetically modified organisms uh, as food, it's very predictable because you know exactly what your yield's gonna be. You know you're eradicating the weeds and the competing resources for that particular crop. Uh, so it makes it a more predictive business model. But again, it comes with a cost. And unfortunately, the cost is to our demise and really our own health and wellness. Well, for me, it's all about understanding and being driven by data. And for me, trained as a biochemist and a physiologist, my entire kind of objective was understanding how the human body works. Because once we understand the biochemistry and physiology of, of human medicine, then we can take steps to start to develop rational interventions and rational therapies. And I think it's the same here. You know, we have to understand what this land needs to increase its yield and to be the most productive. So that means getting data, doing soil samples, understanding, you know, how many head of cattle you can graze per acre of land here to maximize yield not only on the land, but maximize yield on the cattle production. Well, again, if you go back to the model of say a hundred years ago, now land out here is extremely expensive. I mean, 10, 15, $20,000 an acre. In order to support a family of four, and this was probably 10 years ago, you need at least 200 head of cattle. Well, to run 200 head of cattle, you need at least 800 to 1,000 acres of land. And that's if it's you know improved and there's this lush grass. So what does that mean to buy a thousand acres of land at $10,000 an acre? Who can afford that? And that model back then was based on if the land was paid for, because the, the money, you, the expenditures are on buying the feed, buying the cattle, you know, and all the costs that are incurred to that. But if you're having to make a land payment on a thousand acres or 800 acres, those numbers just do not work. I mean, it's, I don't know how a lot of these people do, unless the land is passed on from generation to generation and the land is fully paid for, then that generational type farming you know, can work. It's just very difficult, if not impossible, to make it work. I mean, fortunately, I'm, I don't do this. I'm not relying on the money I earn from, well, I don't earn any money, it actually costs me money. But the beauty is the tax breaks. You know, you get agricultural exemption on this because it's production agriculture. So really for me, it's the cost savings on the taxes that I would otherwise pay on the, the land that's designated as production agriculture. Mm -hmm.